Friday, I want to welcome everybody at our 288 campus, our Friendswood campus, Alvin campus, Webster campus, Pearland campus, online campus, everybody also joining us from the Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana. It is a great day to be in God's house. Amen to that. It's a great day to be in God's house. I'm a... Okay, if you're brand new and you don't know, uh, what we're doing right now is we took out uh, last weekend and this weekend just to talk about an important subject, and that is the subject of baptism. And uh, awesome news, awesome news. It's not just talk at this church. People are responding, and it has been uh, overwhelming at all of our campuses, and I just... uh, I've always dreamed of being a part of a church where, like in the book of Acts that we read about, where the word would go out, people would respond by going public with their faith in Jesus through baptism, and, and that we, as a church family, would be able to celebrate that, and, and we have been celebrating, and uh, this service, this celebration, I believe, is going to continue. So, and, and, and by the way, let me say this up front, some of you are ready. You've already made that decision that today's the day. Others of you right now, you have no clue. You have no clue. Uh, But I want you to to listen today with an open mind and an open heart. Let God do what God wants to do in you. And uh, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say some of you are going to get baptized today. and You don't even know it at this point. Beginning of the sermon, you're like, maybe, maybe not, probably not. But it'll happen. It'll happen, okay, as we uh, get into that time today. So, Today, what I want to do is I just kind of want to rehash a little bit of last week, but I want to show you why baptism is 100% all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And first of all, I'll say this, in baptism, we identify with Jesus. We talked about this extensively last week, so I'm not going to stay here long, but I do want to repeat it for those who were not here and uh, review it for those who were, because I don't want us to forget this. Baptism looks like what Jesus did for us. It looks like what Jesus did for us. Remember, if you were here last week, I said if Jesus won the Super Bowl for our salvation, then maybe we would toss a football to somebody and they would spike it. It would be like, woohoo, okay, because we would know that they are identifying with Jesus. But baptism looks like what Jesus did for us. What did he do for us? Uh, Romans chapter 6, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in the Christ, in the Christ Jesus were baptized into his, were baptized into his death. Uh, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the very act of laying someone back underneath the water looks like what Jesus did for us. He died for us. He was laid in the tomb. And then when we come back up out of the water, it is symbolic of Jesus rising up from the dead. And he did what he did so that we could have new life, <clears throat> so that we could have salvation. So it's a, it's a picture of what Jesus did for us. It's also the, the, the old us dying. You know, old person's dead. Sin is gone. Sin is dead. Power of sin in my life is dead. And I am reborn to walk in this new life. All because of what Jesus did for us, okay? We're baptized, we're immersed. And by the way, immersion is how baptism was administered for a long, long time. People were immersed into the water. However, baptism has changed over time. It's changed over time. So uh, let me answer a question that I'm often asked whenever we do a sermon or a series that touches on this subject of baptism. The question is this, what if I was sprinkled? What if I was sprinkled? Now, to answer this question, let me give you a brief history of how sprinkling originated. In 251 AD, there was a guy by the name of Novation. Novation was on his deathbed. He wanted to make things right with God and to be baptized before he died. So, church leaders came to his house, but since he was gravely ill, instead of taking Novation to the water, they brought the water to him, and they poured buckets and buckets of water all over the dude while he was in his deathbed. In fact, one, one source says the equivalent of three barrels of water. So he's laying in bed, about to die. <laughs> Strange thing happened. He didn't die. Some of you, some of you think he died. Yeah, he died. No, he didn't die. He didn't die. In fact, uh, which is kind of amazing after having buckets of water poured on you that you, you wouldn't die. But uh, he got better 
And, and later on in his life, he was being considered for an office in the church, which started the debate, was Novation baptized or not? Was he baptized or not? They had never allowed someone into a position of leadership at the church who had not been immersed. So in 251 AD, and from that point on, baptism in critical situations like that took on a, took on a, a new form. It went from immersion as in all the way under the water to pouring water or sprinkling water all over someone's body, okay? And then in 753 AD, Pope Stephen II made it a law that uh, you could baptize someone by not, not drenching them all over, but pouring a little bit of water or sprinkling a little bit of water on somebody's head, that that would now be allowed, but only in cases of necessity. So at that time, if you were in dire need or some other case of necessity, uh, critically ill or whatever, you could be sprinkled on your head and that would, that would count according to the church at that time. But even then, immersion, that's all the way under, was still the preferred method. And then in 1311, and I maybe mentioned this in the services last week, 1311 AD, uh, the church council at Ravenna, uh, they declared that baptism by sprinkling or immersion was indifferent, indifferent as in equal, no difference between the two forms, sprinkling or immersion. So Think about this, 1,300 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, the rule became sprinkling is the same as immersion within the church. And since then, sprinkling has basically become the rule in many churches. And so if you're kind of following the timeline of history here, you see that for one thing, there's less and less water when it comes to baptizing somebody but also that the ceremony looks less and less like what Jesus did for us. It less and less resembles his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So here we are, 2023. Uh, where is uh, the church in general? Uh, uh, where, where, where in a lot of people's minds is baptism now? Well, a lot of people now consider baptism irrelevant. Like it doesn't even matter. And if you, honestly, if you look at the history, that's where we've been heading for a long time. You know, we've been subtracting water for a long time. Uh, but a lot of people are now to the point where they, they say, well, baptism is no big deal. No big deal. Doesn't matter. Baptism's not important. Doesn't do anything anyway. We have diminished in many churches and, and denominations. We have diminished baptism to the point of extinction. Welcome to New Hope Church, <laughs> where we use the Bible, okay? So, this is the authority in our lives for our faith and for our practice. So, if you look at the timeline, where are we on the timeline? Where, where are we? Well, we are up here or back here, 33 AD, where Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing, baptizo, remember the word from last week, baptizo, which means to immerse. That's what we do at this church. Now, I know that we've probably got some people who are conflicted at this moment. Um, because because you, you were sprinkled. Like when you were a baby, your parents had you sprinkled. And, and, and maybe you believe and you feel down deep inside that if you were to be immersed um, like, like, like Jesus talked about, um, that you would be denying your spiritual roots or you would be disrespecting your parents. Let me just address that for just a moment here. Your parents did what they knew. And uh, your parents, pr praise God for your parents, okay? Because they, they did what they knew. They had you in church, praise God for that. Uh, you're blessed to have your parents, amen to that? But hear me now and take this with the spirit with which it is given. Baptism is not about our parents. Baptism is about Jesus. It's about Jesus, and it's about what he did for us, his death, burial, and resurrection, and it's about what he asked us to do, which leads to the second point I want to make here today. In baptism, we follow his example. 
We follow the example of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was perfect. He never, ever, ever sinned. He was perfect. But guess what? Jesus was baptized. He was baptized. Now, why was he baptized? Well, he gives us the reason in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. He gets to the river and he says this out loud. He says, to fulfill all righteousness. That's why he wanted to be baptized, to fulfill all righteousness. Well, what does that mean? I'm going to give you the simplest explanation. To fulfill all the righteousness means to do all the right things that God asks us to do. You think about it. To fulfill, meaning make sure that you do, all righteousness, meaning all the right things that God has asked. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, I do nothing of my own accord. I only do what I see my Father in heaven doing or what he's asked me to do. And so... I'm sure if anyone could have gotten out of being baptized, it would have been Jesus, okay? God's only son. He could have used the God card, but he didn't. Instead, he humbled himself and he got baptized. Matthew chapter 3 tells us this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now, for us, this sounds a little, I guess, nondescript. Uh, uh, if you haven't looked at the map and studied the map a whole lot of Israel, maybe this feels a little nondescript, like it's no big deal, like, like he's running an errand, <clears throat> you know, like us. I, hey, I got gas on the way home, you know, I was about out, and I, I remembered we were out of milk, and so I went to the convenience store, and I got a gallon, so we got milk now. Cost $9, but I got it. And, um, <laughs> like, but other words, in other words, it's like, <clears throat> it's really no big deal. Just something we do in the course of a normal day. Hey, I was driving home and I was down by the Jordan River and John was there baptized and I just stopped and got baptized. You know, it was, it's why I'm all wet in case you're wondering. But but as we like to do as a church, what I want to do is put this verse in the geographical and historical context in which it really lives. Uh, It says Jesus came from uh, Galilee Galilee is a big region at the top of Israel. Uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 9 tells us that the specific spot that Jesus came from to get baptized was the city of Nazareth. That was his hometown before he got kicked out. So he was in Nazareth and he went, he went down. He went down to where John was baptizing in the River Jordan, which was all the way down. And let me show you on the map. All the way down here by Jericho. See, this is Dead Sea right here. So before the Jordan River, which goes from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea, before it gets to the Dead Sea is, the, is Jericho. Across is, uh, is Bethany beyond the Jordan, which is where John hung out. Jesus went from Nazareth all the way down here to where John was baptizing, which I don't know if you can see this at your campus or not. It is, I did this on Google Maps and I did it walking, walking. That's why if you can see it, there's a little man going like this. <laughs> it's 76.3 miles, 76.3 miles. Why would Jesus walk 76.3 miles? Well, we read it in the verse, to be baptized by John. By a show of hands, how many of you have walked 76.3 miles in two or three days, anybody? Me neither, me neither. But for the record, I would if it was something important. Like if there was a cure and the only way to get there was to walk and one of my family members really, really needed it. Give me my shoes. I'm, I'm taking off right now. I would go. I would walk that 76.3 miles and be happy that I could do it. However, I wouldn't walk that far for a gallon of milk. Agreed? But Jesus walked that far to get baptized, which leads me to say today, and I don't think it's a stretch, Jesus considered baptism important, important, and he wanted to leave us this example. Now, funny thing happened when he arrived at the Jordan, he walks down to John who's baptizing, and John looks up, and first thing John says to him is, Nope. You can read about it in uh, Matthew chapter 3. John's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little. I am not baptizing you. Not going to do it. You should baptize me. And then Jesus said those words, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. And 
John understood immediately what Jesus was saying and consented to baptize Jesus immediately then. So here's some good news today. You don't have to walk 76.3 miles to be baptized. In fact, I ask all of our campus pastors at all of our campuses, I, say, I ask them to go, to go to the middle of their auditorium and count how many steps it is to the baptistry at their campus. And uh, just so you know, a couple of them guess at first, and they're terrible guessers. I won't mention names, but... But uh, once they staffed it off, uh, Pastor Jeremy at the 288 campus, uh, uh, 71 steps <clears throat> from uh, the middle of the room to the Bath Street. Uh, Pastor Mike at uh, the Friendswood campus, uh, 50 steps. So you all at the Friendswood campus, you, uh, if you're in the middle of the room, 50 steps, you go down the aisle, out the doors, there's a Bath Street, 50 steps. Pastor Howard at the Alvin campus, uh, that would be uh, from the middle of the room at Alvin, and then the doors over right over here for you. Uh, you would uh, take uh, 45 steps, 45 steps out to the baptistry. Pastor Andy at our Webster campus, uh, that would be, you guys would go out the door over here on the left, baptistry's right outside that door, 45 steps. You go out of the room, hang a sharp left, and you will walk up the stairs and fall in right there. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Jordan at the Pearland campus from the middle of the room, uh, out the back doors and across the little breezeway there outside and underneath the oak tree, 50 steps, 50 steps. Not 76.3 miles. You see the point I'm making? However, just because it's easier does not mean it's not important. It's important. And so Jesus set us the example of following his father's will even though he had to walk days to make it happen. He is our example. And if we want to follow Jesus' example, then we will follow him into the waters of baptism. By the way, do you know this? Jesus' followers follow Jesus. We follow Jesus, which is a nice segue to number three, I believe. Yes, in baptism, we obey Jesus' command. We obey his command. Yes, it is a command. Jesus gave it to us, the church. He commanded the church to baptize. However, we do not baptize people who don't want to be baptized. We don't do it, although that would be fun. <clears throat> like like if, it, if it actually worked, like if you could, like if you could tackle people and then maybe hog time and take them in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then dip them in the water, and they come out a different person and, and be a Christian from that point on. It'd be on, baby. We'd be, be <laughs> And pastors would be huge. to be like, boy, you'd be a good evangelist. You would, right there. You'd get a lot of people to follow Christ. And, uh, but it would, it, I won't stay here long. It could be fun, though. It'd be like... Have you been baptized? No. You're going to be. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. It doesn't work that way. So who do we baptize? We baptize people who have made the decision to repent from their sin and to turn and follow Jesus Christ. That's who we baptize. And, and they're submitting themselves to the command of Jesus as his followers. What's the command? It is this, Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, this is Jesus talking here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Disciples, if you don't know, means followers. And guess what followers do? They follow. So followers of Jesus follow Jesus. They follow him. If I told you, like, I, I, like I'm, I'm trying to get healthier and, and I'm, I'm working out and I decided to do the, like the, the beach body thing, which I'm not doing, by the way, <laughs> and, and, and whatever it's called, P, P90X. So I'm doing that, P90X thing. 90 days, I'm going to have a beach body. Watch out. And, uh, and I got the T-shirt. I wore it in church in P90X. And I put a yard sign, you know, like you get for your kids for honor roll or something. I put up yard sign that says, I'm P90X, you know, 
in real life. Just look at me, you know, and, and put that out in my yard. And I put a sticker on my car, P90X and all that. But I didn't do it. <laughs> like 10 days in, you were at my house. And you say, hey, hey, how's that? Is he the P90X? Stuff everywhere. How's that going? Oh, I haven't done it yet. I haven't done it yet. But only 80 more days, and I'm going to have a beach body. And then, <laughs> then you checked on me like halfway through, and I'm like, uh, no, I haven't, still haven't done it yet. I'm, I don't plan on doing it tomorrow because I've got a busy day tomorrow. You know how it is. But, <laughs> but I only have 45 more days, and I'm going to have a beach body. And this, and, this, and this went on and on until day 89. I'm like, no, I still haven't done it. But tomorrow, tomorrow, when I wake up, day 90, beach body, you know. It, it would not... It would not take you 90 days before you could rightly say to me, Pastor, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. And honestly, right now, our world is filled with people who are fooling themselves. And I say that because there's a lot of people who call themselves Jesus followers, but they don't follow Jesus. That is, they don't obey his commands. Now, our mission as a church is what? You know what? To... That wasn't the best effort that I've heard. <laughs> Maybe I need to teach that today. Uh, our mission as a church, I'll say it, you say it along with me, all of our campuses. Our mission as a church is to know Christ and to make him known. That's what we do. That's why we do what we do. And uh, this is not some abstract concept of knowing him. Well, how do you know him? Well, how do we know if we know him? First John chapter 2, verse 3 says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we obey, if we keep his commands, if we obey his commands. So, if you needed another good reason to get baptized, this is it. Jesus commanded it. And, and, and people who follow Jesus follow his commands. They follow Jesus. And it was his idea. And when we obey him, it shows that we know him. And then uh, let, me, let me give you one more. One more, and then we're going to see what God does in church today. And uh, again, open, open hearts, open minds. Let God's Holy Spirit move in you and uh, lead you to your decision today, okay? So in baptism, we show that we are on Team Jesus. We show that we're on Team Jesus. I don't know if you pay any attention whatsoever to the NFL draft. And if you don't, I don't blame you. But um, I try not to pay attention. And, 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 and then I accidentally paid attention. And, <laughs> and if you're kind of new with this, I'm a Texans fan. But I have been hurt so many times that... <laughs> It's hard for me to love anymore because my heart has been hurt. Anybody else feel that pain? Yeah. But I'm trying. I'm trying to work through it, to go into counseling. And... So I, I refuse to get too excited about this, but uh, we got a guy uh, a week or two ago, whenever it was, uh, that's supposed to be pretty awesome, Heis Heisman Trophy runner-up <clears throat> and uh, two-year starter at Ohio State. His name is C.J. Stroud, and, and I've always been fascinated by the process of the draft. And, and when I say that, I mean uh, a team will call out the guy's name. And, and let's just backtrack now to last week, Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost after Jesus had given that command to go make disciples, baptizing them. So just fast forward just a little bit. Church begins, Peter's preaching to thousands of people, and somewhere in the middle of the sermon, somebody yells out, what must we do? Brothers, what must we do? And, and Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you'll receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for you, it's for your children, it's for all who are far off, and all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. So there's the call, right? So back to, the, back, back to the draft. Same thing happens with all the guys. A team calls out their name. 
And the Texans called out, C.J. Stroud. And he stood up, and I'm trying not to get too excited. (laughs) But he stood up, and even though I'm trying not to get excited, I did take screenshots. He stood up. He stood up, this is the young man right here, and you can, maybe you can tell or can't tell, but he is like on the verge of tears. Like right when they said his name and his mama hugged him, you could just see it was like it just wanted to burst forth, okay? But he held it together, you know, trying to be cool in front of everyone. And he did the little walk that they have to do down through a doorway that they've assigned for all the guys who've been drafted to walk through. And immediately when he walked through that door, there was a gentleman there that had a Texans hat and he turns and he hands him the Texans hat and CJ then immediately puts it on his head and then adjusts it in the mirror there. And uh, this is like, I don't know, 30 seconds after the Texans call his name, he puts on Texans gear. Then he walks out in front of the crowd uh, and there's thousands of people there and reporters from everywhere, TV cameras, all of that going on. People cheering, the commissioner's out there, the commission, commissioner gives him a hug, the commissioner has in his hand a Texans jersey and after he hugs CJ, you see this right here. Once again, please Lord, let it go well. Um, <laughs> But I find it very interesting that literally within a minute or two after a player's name is called, he's holding up or he's wearing the jersey that identifies him with his new team. He's put on that team now, okay? You following me? Paul tells us in Galatians chapter three, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through what? Through Faith, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Another translation, this is the NIV, the ESV says, you have put on Christ. Now call me simple, but I want to be in Christ. I want to be clothed with Christ. Because here's the deal. Someday we're all going to stand before God. A holy, almighty God who cannot take any sin in his presence, will will not tolerate it. And I wanna be dressed right on that day. And I will tell you, I have no righteousness on my own. I got nothing, I got nothing. I don't deserve to take one step through the pearly gates of heaven when I die. But I do have something going for me. I have Jesus, I have Jesus. And thank you, God, Jesus is enough. He's enough. His death, his burial, and his resurrection is enough. So I want to be clothed with him when I walk into the presence of Almighty God. And now, some of you who have not done this have that opportunity right now. In fact, if you've not put your faith in Jesus, I would say do it now. Do it now. Do it now. And uh, for those of you who've been running from God, don't run from God. He is your only hope. Run to him. Run to him. Put your faith in him. And then get baptized. And like I said, some of you still maybe at this moment, you need to be baptized, but, and, and, and you weren't planning on it, and you still don't know if you're going to. But I will tell you this. We've got T-shirts. We've got shorts for you to wear. We've got towels. You can be baptized today. Now is your opportunity to put on Christ and to show the world that you are Team Jesus. So at this time, I'm gonna invite all of our campus pastors to come to the stage and they're gonna explain to you what's gonna happen next. Listen to me, God has called you by name. It's time to respond, and I'm praying that you will. Love you guys. All right, so I know we have some people in the room today that are ready to get baptized. You've signed up. You've registered. I see a lot of the Team Jesus t-shirts out there. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. In just a moment, I'm going to have you guys stand up, and we're, we're going to cheer for you because this is a significant moment in your life. But 
But if you're here today and you were just listening to Pastor Tim and you did not come uh, prepared, you didn't register ahead of time, you didn't let anybody know you were going to get baptized, but just as you were listening to the, the Bible being preached, you said, I need to take this step. I need to say yes to God. When I get to three, I want you to stand up too, and we're going to cheer for you as well, okay? And then I'm going to have you that are not pre-registered. If you go out these doors and hang a right, Mary and Amy are going to be at a cart. They've got T-shirts. They've got towels. They will take you, take care of you, get you ready to go, okay? So when I get to three, if you are going to be baptized, just stand on up. We want to cheer for you. One, two, three. Come on, come on, come on. All right, those of you that are standing, y'all are awesome. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and head out towards the baptistry. I'm giving you a head start. If you've got a kid, if you've got a student in kids or student ministry and they're going to get baptized, go grab them. Meet us out at the baptistry. We would love to do that. Um, the rest of us, I've got a couple of announcements to make. So you guys, go. We're going to go celebrate. Everybody else, hold tight for just a second. All right, next weekend, we start an insomnia series, uh, things that keep you up at night. Uh, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have some prayer partners up here that would love to pray with you. If you have not taken that step to put your faith in Christ as your Savior, it's a great day to do that. You can come forward. The prayer partners will help you. And then guess what? We're going to march you right out there. We're going to get you baptized. We're going to take care of the whole meal deal today, okay? Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity we have to celebrate with people who are jumping on the team Jesus today, God. Thank you for your death your burial and resurrection that makes it possible. God, thank you so much for your son. We love you so much today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We got prayer partners up here. Otherwise, hang out and celebrate out in the baptistry, guys.